Welcome to Period Action Day. Guys, we're super excited. Um, it's been a lot of work put into this and uh, specifically here today, we wanted to be working to amplify the voices of youth activists within the movement, people who have uh, really been working on the ground um, to, towards menstrual equity and, and combating period poverty. So just again, we'll just give it another second or so. I see people coming in slowly here. So thank you guys for joining. All right. Okay, so let's get going real quick. So again, thank you guys for coming for, to, to um, this webinar today for Period Action Day. Um, this panel is going to be about uh, youth activists in the menstrual movement. And we are extremely excited to um, have Alicia Naprakowski here. She's a, a journalist who has written about period poverty for Teen Vogue. And she's going to be discussing issues and stigmas surrounding period poverty and its effects on marginalized communities, intersectional activism, and other topics with these youth activists that we have here today. Um, so I'll leave it to Alicia to introduce uh, the activists and the panelists we have with us. And um, yeah, we're super excited about this. So Alicia, feel free to take it away. Ooh, thank you. I am so excited to be here and to speak with all of you wonderful activists and um, welcome to Period Action Day. So I would love for each of you to introduce yourself, um, tell us your name, your preferred pro pronouns, and the work that you do. If um, Amber, you would like to take it away. Hello, everyone. My name is Amber Wynn. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am a junior nursing major, criminal justice minor, attending the illustrious Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia. And I currently serve on the Youth Advisory Council here at Period. Hi, my name is Hannah. I use pronouns she, her, hers as well. Um, I'm a senior right now. Um, not a great time to be a senior, but I'm a senior right now and uh, attending a Northern Virginia high school. Um, and I am a co-founder and service lead of um, a grassroots organization in Northern Virginia called Mission Red. Hi everyone, my name is Bree Reddick. My pronouns are she, hers. I am a writer and operator of my own website, brewretic.com, where I talk about the intersections of social justice and menstruation. Hi everyone, my name is Miriam. I use she, her, her pronouns, and I'm currently a freshman in college. I was the former Connecticut uh, period state lead, and I'm currently doing a lot of things behind the scenes for the menstrual movement, and I'm so excited to be here with you all today. I am also so excited. Thank you so much for those great introductions. Um, I'd love to just dive right in and get started with why young people such as yourselves are the leaders in the anti-period poverty movement and the menstrual equity space. What is, why are you here? What is it that drives you to be in this space? And um, Amber, if you'd like to take it away again. That's a great question. So for me, how I got started within the menstrual movement and period equity space, um, it started in high school, just kind of the general like, we start, we need to create our own like little period pantries inside the bathrooms and the school wouldn't approve it. So we kind of did it under the table anyways. Um, but then once I got to college, I noticed that there was only menstrual product dispensers in women's bathrooms. And we do have quite a handful of individuals who do not identify as women but do menstruate. So what I did this past school year was uh, petition students to see if we can get free menstrual products on my campus. And my campus is a little different compared to most college campuses because I do attend a historically black college and university, also known as an HBCU. Uh, over 90%, excuse me, over 90% of us identify as black and over 65% of us menstruate. So with that being said, you kind of think that our school would be accommodating to that demographic, but unfortunately my school is a little bit behind the times. So um, this past school year, I petitioned the student body, found out the administration was not with it. So I was like, okay, how can I do this work with and ensure that I'm protecting my students, but also work without the help of administration. So I've been reaching out to a lot of brands and I wanted to um, help 
bump up what was an already existing emergency reproductive hotline on my campus. And now I'm currently running it full time. Um, we give out free emergency contraception, condoms, um, menstrual products, including pads, tampons, menstrual cups, uh, pregnancy tests, anything reproductive health and menstrual health, we have it and students just contact us whenever they need it and we deliver it to them for free. So that's the most recent thing I've been doing in the menstrual movement and that's kind of like my full circle since high school up until now. Yeah, I feel like um, definitely period movement is really, really good with incorporating youth into the organization, obviously, as um, the biggest, you know, youth led NGO in menstrual equity space. Um, so I did start off with um, period, um, obviously getting into it and just getting right into the DC chapter, which was um, I think the second biggest chapter in period movement, but I'm not exactly sure. But the first like major event that I did do when I first was in the space was National Period Day and probably one of my favorite days ever because um, when we went in there, honestly, it was just like 200 like young people honestly gathering together for this specific cause and it was just really empowering to see everybody there especially in my first first month of getting into the menstrual equity space i think that was the greatest introduction that i could ever have um listening to all these amazing people tell their stories and tell everything that why they're into the space made me want to get more into this movement and i understood like why people do it um, so like I just continued doing work with chapters like holding drives um, and we don't needed to we don't need over 7000 products to the BLM DC. Um, and it's really nice because we obviously live near DC so um, we obviously try to cater to that community more since we're so close to it. And then um, I broke off and then made my own organization, Mission Red, um, to do more grassroots work in Northern Virginia. And now we are full time just running events, running drives. Um, and I couldn't be happier because working with all these young people really makes a difference. Because when I was maybe like a year ago, year and a half ago, I seriously did not think that I could do any of this because it's more like, it's like, oh no, like I can't do that. It's just the people I see online. But truly, like once you get into it, you're like, I am making a difference and I can do it and I can help others do it as well. So that's probably the main takeaway that I've gotten from all this. So my introduction to the menstrual movement was kind of unconventional, actually. So I graduated college in 2019 and um, while I was in college, I did a lot of work with uh, campus sexual assault and I found that being an, activi an activist for campus sexual assault was incredibly draining and I kind of was so focused on kind of the loss of embodiment. And so funny enough, I actually won an Instagram giveaway where I won a menstrual cup. And that just completely revolutionized the way I saw my period. I saw it as something that I could manage, something that wasn't just happening to me, but rather something that I could control and I was empowered in. And I think that menstruation is a great first step to understanding embodiment and understanding um, just like sexual education in general. And it's a great starting point for especially young people to understand that we do have autonomy and we do have control of what happens to us. And we're not just, you know, damned into situations and that we can control how we feel about things and what is going on. So I think that the menstrual movement to me is absolutely about access, but it's also about changing the way we conceptualize our period, changing the way we experience it, and just understanding all the different systems at work that are making us feel like our period is something that is a curse or rather something that we're being punished for. And so, yeah. That's it. Yeah, so hi everyone, sorry about that. Um, my introduction to the period movement I think was just growing up as kind of like a menstruator and having so many experiences of like the first time I got my period in a bathroom and I was like freaking out. I didn't know how anything worked. Um, and then all the way up till high school, I remember not having a pad or not having access to something and then being charged in the nurse's office, things like that, where you'd really think about, you know, if I cut my hand or if I got hurt, would I have to be paying for a Band-Aid? Would I have to be paying for those kinds of things? And the answer is no. Um, that's when I really started to pay attention to it and then period came about um, a couple of friends and I got together we were like let's let's do this and I would say in the beginning 
it was also a process, I think, of, of a lot of growth. It wasn't something I was comfortable talking about initially. Um, and being in that space where you have to be so vocal and unapologetic about your period was a little bit of a challenge at first because we're always taught, you know, it's dirty and it's shameful. You should be ashamed of it. And I think this kind of like journey as not only organizing, I've organized before just as a Muslim woman, um, but organizing in this space was also just a form of like empowerment of, of being loud and of being just unapologetic and, and who you are. And I think especially now young people are leading movements in so many different ways. We're currently in the midst of a pandemic. We're talking about like, you know, a lot of racism, a lot of public health kind of um, issues. It's a pivotal, pivotal time because we're dealing with so much as young people. Um, I'm only 18 years old and I'm sure some people here are even younger than that. Um, but we've grown up to say that this is wrong and I think young people are the ones who are really passionate and invigorating and, and ready to kind of lead that fight. Thank you so much. Those are all incredible answers and it's, I love that you shared your experiences because I too have felt so many so many similar things and I know so many other people do as well but your voice is so valuable. Um, so how does it feel to be a member of Gen Z and to be so vocal because I do have to say your voice is definitely you are unapologetic about it and it's just a really amazing thing because it is such a taboo topic that really growing up even I'm not much older than you but it's different, like no one really talked about it, but you are all talking about it and creating movements and starting new things and really taking it on with, with no, I'm trying to think of the right word, but you're just taking it on. And I would love to hear about how you feel being such an important part of the movement. And if um, Brie, you would like to begin on that. Yeah, so um, I guess I would say I'm both motivated, but also a bit angry. Um, I definitely believe in an ethic of love and collective care, and that takes into account our ancestors and people who will be here in the future and our future kids and generations. And I feel like that necessarily, that hasn't necessarily been done to us. Um, I think we've, young people have inherited a lot of issues. I mean, from gun violence to period poverty to climate um, change, you know, we don't really have a say in our future. And when we just look at the time that we have, a lot for a lot of us, we're fighting for our lives. We're fighting for the ability to just exist. And I think that makes me angry because it's not fair that the generations before us didn't have the same kind of like collective care that I think young people today have. And so I'm, I'm a bit angry, but I'm also incredibly motivated to see such like global mobilization from every issue, but particularly issues that affect young people and the generations to come. And I think that we have a fresh perspective and I think that ultimately it, does really well when juxtaposed against the older majority that's in positions of power. Yeah, I would completely agree with you because we've definitely inherited so many problems that the world has definitely created, but we're here, you know, we're here to fix it. We're here to, you know, make the injustices right because that's what we're here to do. Um, and I know that there's a huge taboo with talking about periods. Even when we were little, we'd say, oh, like, can I, can I go to the bathroom? Like, <laughs> whisper it to your teacher really quickly. Um, but honestly, you shouldn't have to because it's something that's a natural thing. And if you can't take care of that natural thing on your own, then that's not the right way to live. And then you should be fighting for that right to be able to take care of it on your own because it's a normal thing, it's normal body function. Um, when I first got into the space, um, people would be like, oh, like periods, interesting. Like, <laughs> um, and I, I really liked being in the space though because it empowered me to want to talk about periods. And it's a kind of funny, it's like, I like talking about periods. I'm sorry, like I do. Um, so it's definitely something that like, 
being in this movement has really helped me because along with the community, you have a bunch of people who also feel the same way as you, who also want to, you know, fight these injustices and make sure that we live a better world for our kids. Um, they don't have to go through the same struggles that we went through as well. So we're all in the same community, we're all in the same area, and we want, it just makes it so much easier just to be feel empowered in this instead of feeling like it feels like a chore, you know. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I think a lot of this is just about rejecting the status quo and rejecting what we accept um, as being normal. And I think a lot of young people are here to challenge that. You know, when we talk about a lot of these issues, a lot of older generations may just kind of be like, that's the way it is, right? There's some sort of acceptance there. And I think young people are here to say, no, it doesn't have to be this way. Um, and like Brie talked about, there's a lot of hope and motivation that comes out of that, but there's also just a lot of anger and, and a lot of resentment at seeing the way systems are built right now. Um, but I think a lot of this work gets easier in doing it and having that community there. I think there's so many people ready to do the work. It's inspiring to see how many people come together. Um, I remember we did National Period Day. We had no clue what to expect. We were like, this is our first rally. And not only is this our first rally, it's on periods. Uh, we don't know how receptive our community is going to be. And we had a few hundred people show up excited, screaming about pads like uh, <laughs> in the morning on the New Haven Green. And I think that those moments, those those small moments of just joy when they're that that feeling of just community and, and warmth and that empathy and that love um, really trumps any of the the negative feelings that usually come along with with doing this work. So I'd say this work is, is really, really tiring. Um, but at the same time, it's so nice to have such a thriving and beautiful community there to support you every step of the way. I absolutely couldn't agree more. I think one, I know for me personally, um, when I was addressing this question, the first thing that came up to me was my great grandmother and she will be turning 101 next month. So when she talks to me, um, about our history and what our people have gone through, it's these same cycles of oppression that are repeating. We're just slapping a new name on it, or it's, we're not even slapping a new name on it, but for in certain circumstances, yeah, excuse me, English is my first language, in certain circumstances. So it's, I know for me personally, it's just kind of frustrating watching, of course it's on a different scale, but my great grandmother is going through the same things that I went through almost a hundred years ago. And then she goes back even further in telling what her great grandmother went through. So that is my biggest motivation towards just being a voice within the activism movement, whether it's regards to priest brutality, menstrual equity, reproductive justice, whatever it is, because like, I refuse to have this cycle of oppression continue on past me. Um, and I think a lot of the things that are happening in this world is reflecting like whether or not we want to bring children into this world because if I'm going through this right now and I, as you all can see I'm a nursing student so like I go into the hospital and I get called derogatory words every day every day and it's so disgusting and it's very discouraging to want to keep going back in to treat these patients who really just don't want to see me just because I'm a black student but then you have to have to remember that this issue is bigger than me and what I'm personally going through. And I need to ensure that I'm preventing the future from experiencing what we're experiencing today and what the past has experienced as well. Thank you. You all touched on really, really important points. I definitely have to agree with everything you said. It's crazy to realize that we are still experiencing things that people were experiencing 100 years ago. And I noticed when Bree said angry at the beginning, you all nodded your heads simultaneously. So you can, I mean, yes, anger is a very passion driving feeling, I would say. And going off of that, how do you think centering period poverty helps to fight against the other inequalities like in, in other fields and spaces because there are so many inequities that have been passed down to your generation. And I would love for um, Hannah to begin on that if you'd like. Yeah, of course, with the recent BLF movement, we've noticed that um, racial equality is 
still, still an injustice that hasn't been served to this day. Um, and obviously we want to, you know, we want to fix that injustice. And the part of menstrual equity is like, obviously people who don't get more access to menstrual equity are those who are more impoverished, um, those who are more marginalized communities. Um, so that's why we aim for those communities, right? Um, and then in those communities, there it's mainly minorities. And then there we go, we've got the racial equity situation going on. I could go on with other um, issues uh, that relate to menstrual equity, but obviously we're not going to just fix menstrual equity. Okay, we're obviously we're trying to improve society for the better because in general we we all face injustices every day and we want to fix them right so um the period equity space is so nice because whenever we are trying to aim for like a small event let's say we're doing like a self-care event like i don't know like a journaling event um truly we're also helping other people out there who maybe have felt bad that day they don't feel like they're themselves and that's it's not just we're like handing out period products and we're not handing, handing out tampons but we're also helping people mentally and physically because period equity is overall a body problem it's it's a world problem and it's not something that we can ignore it's not something that's just going to go away with time because we need to address it, it needs to be done um, and that's why we're here we're here to fix not just our problems but everyone's problems as well yeah, I completely agree with everything you said. I mean, I think that we, I think a lot of people underestimate how intersectional the fight for period poverty is. I mean, if we just want to take the environment as a example, right, there's about 45 billion period products that are thrown in the trash each year. Most of them, a lot of them are not going to ever decompose. And the trash is not, you know, it's not going in white affluent communities, right? It's being placed in impoverished communities, black and brown communities, who are already experiencing um, environmental injustice and racism and already probably have toxins in their water, their um, food systems, and in their air. And so not only are people limited to accessing period products, but they're also disproportionately dealing with the waste of period products. That's not theirs, and that is now their burden. Um, and I think that Ultimately, period poverty is a great, or just menstru the menstrual movement in general, is a great first step to kind of unpacking all of these huge systemic problems that feel so inaccessible, right? Like, how am I supposed to combat these huge things that, are, that have been around before me, that will be around after me, and that just seem so inaccessible? And I think that addressing period poverty is a really good, just uh, direct action to do. Right, because if we start giving sustainable period products or we start advocating for, you know, um, uh, the end of period stigma, I think that that goes a long way in not only just period poverty, but also uh, environmental justice and racial justice and gender justice and reproductive justice. I think these are all part of the same sphere of injustice. And I think that, you know, for me, and I'm sure everyone else on the panel, a great way to access that first is to just talk about periods. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I 100% agree with everything that was just said. The menstrual movement is so incredibly intersectional. And although um, it might not feel like you're making a big impact, we're touching on so many different issues. Like Bree said, literally talking about your period is one step closer to like dismantling patriarchy, to talking about class issues, talking about socioeconomic levels. Um, and that's what's so amazing, I think, about this movement, right? We're touching on issues of race, why women of color are disproportionately affected by period poverty. We're talking about LGBTQ justice, right? Why some other communities are impacted more um, hardly by this. Um, you're also talking about just issues of, of classism and, and environmental racism, like Brie talked about. And I think that's why it's so empowering. These are really big systemic kind of, you don't even know where to start. Where do we start when it comes to issues that are so, so big to tackle? Um, and periods are kind of a simple way of touching on so many of those factors to getting to some of these systemic issues in a really positive um, and community oriented way. I think anytime you do this work and kind of like what Hannah touched on, 
um, there's so many other components to to this work. It's like you might be giving out pads, um, but we make sure we always write personal notes. We always focus on mental health. We always make sure we're trying to support them in whatever way we can. So it might seem like a pad. It might seem like a period, um, but it's a really big step to dismantling a lot of the systemic inequities we have. And then also just building a community out of that uh, mutual community support groups and making sure we're building that aid and that capacity within our communities. Most definitely. Um, one thing that I love how everybody on the panel touched is how everything somehow connects to each other. So like Bree said, environmental justice and police brutality, like everything within the activism sphere impacts it's like a domino effect. So if one is falling, the next thing is going to fall as well. So when it comes to activism in general, it's important to focus in on like Vis like visualize everything that your work could possibly impact. So if, for example, like giving a pad, it is a holistic experience. It's not simply just having, just ensuring that you're not gonna bleed on your pants. Like it is literally a mental thing. It's a spiritual healing. It's have, like Bree said, having control over your menstrual cycle. It's a form of empowerment. So when we are centering period poverty, like Bree said, we are ensuring that we're combating everything else as well, but like we all came from someone who menstruates. So we need to ensure, like it's not just a woman's issue. It's a, it's a world issue. Like it's something that impacts, even if you are someone who doesn't menstruate at all, you are somehow impacted by period poverty. So starting when we're talking about how we can ensure that everyone has equal accessibility, whether it's from a financial aspect to like reset having trash in your neighborhood or, police brutality, whatever it is, starting at periods is one of the ways that we can help the other dominoes that are falling and ensure that everybody is able to achieve menstrual justice and reproductive justice. Thank you. I would love to have um, Amber, actually, because I know before you said that your school has a lack of inclusivity with period products being available. And I would love to go into why it is important to center marginalized communities in the fight for menstrual equity. I love that question. So um, a lot of the work that I do at Hampton University, I, I, as a nursing student, I emphasize the education around menstruation because to me as a nurse, like that's how my brain works. So like, I want, if you are educated properly on how to avoid this healthcare issue, you never have to see me in the first place. So if I am educating everyone on, you know, let's educate on endometriosis, fibroids, let's um, figure out how you can get affordable products, which those types of issues happen to impact, excuse me, impact people of color, specifically Black people. So when I'm looking at my historically Black college, I absolutely love Hampton, but we are seriously behind. Um, the idea that women are the only people who menstruate is a phenomenon to them. Um, so those are the type of things that I'm battling currently at my school to try to achieve this menstrual justice that we want to see. So whether it's hosting um, events about the hotline or physically showing students like how I create the packages to mail to them or you know like today we sent out a post because we're starting our menstrual education week so we're going to be talking about fibroids and endometriosis and how that impacts primarily people of color. Um, that's how we're going to try to improve and help build more activism within our community but I think another reason why there is a lack of activism within the Black community simply is because, you know, we're battling other things. Um, for some of us, I know for some students that I am friends with, like, we're afraid of being shot when we walk out of our homes. Every time we see a police officer behind us, like, like you, you freeze. So it's kind of hard for certain communities to get behind the menstrual movement because like the immediate need, the immediate danger is we're worried about the people around us and we don't always have time to focus on our menstrual health, um, which is something I'm trying to hopefully improve within the future and hopefully that'll be fixed by the time I leave Hampton. 
Yeah, I definitely hear you all and all that. And um, I really appreciate your fight for trying to get free menstrual products because it's most important because a lot of people use that as a main resource to get tampons and get pads because a lot of the times they can't even afford them from the stores. So that's why we find them to get them in schools. Um, and I'm in Fairfax County. Um, yes, one of the richest county in the United States. Um, and we still have not gotten free products. Um, but we, um, my team tried to strategize with the super, the, with the, the, the FCPS board member. And um, he recently passed the policy to not he, but the government governor passed a policy to ensure that all Virginia schools have to have free menstrual products. Um, obviously with Corona, we weren't able to see that happen, but um, I'm kind of excited to see that when the year comes. Um, and obviously it didn't happen with any, it didn't happen with peaceful um, staying at home and doing nothing. It happened with a fight. You know, you have to voice the fact that you, you want these products because we need them. And that's what democracy is about, you know, voicing your opinion so that you can make change happen. You know, the 19th Amendment didn't come with, you know, just sitting at home and talking to your kids about how they should, you know, like not talk in business meetings or wear skirts below your knees. No, because you should voice your opinions for the facts that things that you're that you're passionate about and um that's why we continue to try to help these marginalized communities and we try to provide for them because we're trying to tell we're trying to tell the government that they seriously need to do the same it's not it's not our job and we'll do it anyways but it's their job you know it's their job to cater to the people if they're not going to do it then we're going to do it and we're going to keep voicing our opinion until they do it for them as well Yeah, I think um, centering the voices of marginalized communities is, is so, so important in this work because they've been disenfranchised in so many ways and building up that power to amplify and uplift their voices is so important. And I think another aspect of that is just having a lot of respect for people who came before you, people who have been doing this work, people who have been experiencing it from the start. Um, and a lot of times that's centering BIPOC, Black voices specifically, and making sure you are not doing this as a sort of performative kind of thing. And I think that's really, really important, especially in the climate we're in, to make sure you're actually doing the work. And actually doing the work is listening to people of that community, um, uplifting those voices, and making sure you're not being counterproductive and, and not listening and, and doing your own thing. Um, and I think in terms of, of a lot of this work at the school level, I went to Hampton High School and when I was there, a lot of it was just changing the environment and changing the environment that we speak about periods and kind of doing that destigmatizing work. And a lot of that was just with having simple conversations. Uh, we started something called Period Heroes. So uh, a lot of, at the time, the school was charging for period products, which was absurd. Hamden has, it's a pretty poor town and a lot of, out of Connecticut um, with a lot of people of color and a lot of socioeconomic inequity. I'm so sorry. Um, and I, I think when we kind of spoke about that issue, it was crazy to think number one, these weren't free and they weren't supplied, but also that there were teachers who were using their own paychecks to buy products for students. And that's the kind of community that's the kind of love we're talking about here, that teachers cared enough to buy products, teachers who are already struggling um, for their students. And that's kind of where we started Period Heroes. We collected a bunch of products. We got teachers to put hearts on their doors to sh show um, you know, that they had products and that they're accessible. And even starting that conversation really opened up this environment where we could actually talk about periods a little bit more openly. Um, we worked on a few bills in the state to try to get free menstrual products in all of our middle schools and high schools and with COVID, um, similar to Hannah, we're not really sure how far it's going to get. Um, but, you know, we're, we're not done fighting. And I think what's not, another thing that's so great is that there's so many creative ways to kind of talk about the issue. Um, there's so many creative ways to kind of tackle it, even if it's like putting hearts on doors or collecting products or talking about policy. Um, you can get involved in so many ways. So for anyone watching, um, you can literally get involved into the you know period or menstrual movement even if you haven't in so many different ways whatever qualities you bring are going to be an asset in some way 
Yeah, I mean, when Miriam said that um, we have to recognize the people that came before us, I think that's super important because at the end of the day, before there were pads, before there were tampons, people were managing their periods somehow. And I think that a lot of the times people center kind of Western um, ways of managing your period and at understanding that there are cultures who have been managing their periods in different ways that may not be Western centered, um, I think is super important. And that's also a way we combat period poverty because that affects the way that we identify period poverty, right? So if for a certain community, um, they do not use tampons or pads or menstrual cups, right? But they have their own culturally specific um, period management products. I think that's important that we recognize that and we allocate resources accordingly. So I think that sometimes we do need to decolonize kind of the ways that we approach period poverty because at the end of the day, no, everyone experiences their periods differently and they should have autonomy and the way that they um, manage it. Thank you, those are all such important points. And I did wanna quickly jump to the Q&A. There is a question from Melissa and her question is, how are you all combating anti-blackness in the menstrual activist space? Whoever would like to start on that, I will let you, since that is a audience question. Um, oh, so sorry. <laughs> Okay, so sorry. Um, um, so the reason, the main reason that I kind of broke off and co-founded my own organization is because you know your community best and you know how to serve it. And grassroots, community, uh, grassroots organizations, um, in my opinion, are the best way to, you know, find your own needs that your community has. Because every community is different, you know, everyone has a different um, population, everyone has a different um, minority population, and that's definitely something that I want to carry as I go on to my next chapter as a menstrual activist. Um, and our first events were obviously trying to, you know, be respectful of the BLM movement and trying to be a part of it and trying to go, trying to continue the, continue the fight for racial equity. Um, so we we really tried um, <laughs> to hold events for informational events to try to inform people about, you know, why we do this, why we do our work to um, continue racial equity, um, racial equity, oh my gosh, racial equality, um, <laughs> and uh, continue to try to inform people because at the end of the day, that's probably one of the most important things is to stay informed and listen to those who are trying to inform you because if you don't even try to listen to those in the first place, then you're not going to be able to further yourself as an activist or as a person in general. Um, and so in the end, we um, didn't have a great turnout, but we did really try. Um, we also do try to um, donate to those, obviously in marginalized communities with a greater black population, because those are the ones that are overlooked. Those are the ones that government don't exactly like to um, help the most and we we already see that with our current climate we see that with our current system and that's something we're trying to combat in the first place um, and overall we are trying to voice our opinions for those who you know like show anti-blackness policies or show anti-blackness in our communities because again like racial equality is a menstrual equality um, problem and it's something that we can't avoid it's something we can't ignore it's something we have to fight for um, so eventually we are trying to um, cater to the both issues. Yeah, um, I think for me, one of the ways that anti-blackness manifests in the menstrual movement are the ways that um, kind of NGOs get involved with period poverty. When we think about period poverty, I think a lot of people like to displace that onto third world countries, particularly African countries. Um, and as if it's not something that's happening in their own community, in their own neighborhoods, in their own vicinity, right? Um, I think that we absolutely have, if we have the resources, we should help other communities that are combating period poverty, but let's be culturally competent. Let's, get, let's give them the tools in order to empower themselves, right? Let's not 
you know, feed into this white savior complex of we're going to come and we're going to save you all, but rather we're going to give you the resources and center your experiences, center your needs and your solutions, and we're going to do exactly that rather than coming in with our own biases and Western context of what period poverty looks like. I think we need to absolutely center the experiences and the culture of the community that we are catering to. And ultimately that of course has an intersectional lens and it of course has people um, in their cultures and communities and their narratives first. And so yeah, just not, you know, becoming a missionary and going to Africa and being like, look, I saved all these black and brown kids, but rather maybe not you going to Africa at all and you actually using that money to support local communities and local businesses that are already doing that work because I'm sure that they are already there. Yeah, I, I mean, 100%. I think the white savior complex and just this idea of being the hero in the story and not giving people the tools to empower themselves is is a form of racism. Um, I remember at our rally, we actually had a few women from this NGO who are incredibly rude, incredibly disrespectful. Um, and you kind of want to be aware of that. You want to be self-conscious of what space you're taking up, what you're projecting, and whether you're doing more harm. Um, in terms of combating anti-Blackness, uh, especially in the menstrual space, I think a lot of what our chapter has done is really focusing on anti-racist work as central to what we do. Um, I'm thinking of one example. There was a teenager from Connecticut named Mubarak Suleiman um, who was shot by police officers. And one of our team members actually was really, really good friends with him. Um, we made sure that our team's really, really diverse and actual community you know, um, organizers who have been doing this work and you know, we were there, the entire period team was there at that rally. We've been working with Kira, who's been organizing for months and just a big shout out to the organizers who are doing work in this space. Um, and I think that's what's so important in terms of you know, combating anti-Blackness, making sure we're showing up. We're showing up for other causes and we're showing up for causes that are related to ours. And it might seem like you know, we're doing period work, we're doing menstrual justice work, and like we talked about before, it's inextricably linked to so many issues and we need to make sure we're doing right by our community and being there, making sure we're centering those voices and supporting in whatever way we can. I absolutely love all of your responses. One thing that I would add, well, from my personal experience, since I do attend a historically black college, I am very fortunate that this is the first time in my entire life where I am not being oppressed um, within the menstrual activist movement because on my own physical campus, I'm not experiencing this. Um, but however, as soon as I drive five minutes away from my school, I'm back at it again. So I think one of the things that I've done to help combat that anti-Blackness within the menstrual activist space is ensuring that I'm using education on the forefront. Um, because when I'm going to menstrual equity rallies, the person that you see on the television screen or you see within the pictures on the media is a person who does not look like me. And more often than not, that person is not facing the same, how do I say this? Basically, the person who is the least, who ha who is worst off typically is a black woman or a black menstruator. Um, so cases of endometriosis, as I said, fibroids, just having simple access to menstrual products, that is directly impacting communities of color, specifically Black people. So when I'm moving into these anti-Black spaces, I'm going, okay, so if you're saying that all periods matter, we need to highlight and help the people who are worse off than you because the people you don't realize that you are only advocating for yourself when there are people literally as Bree said in your own communities who are battling ugh, literally battling the this fight to simply like they're choosing between whether they buy food for themselves over buying a pad whether you know they pay for their kid to go to soccer practice or buy a menstrual cup, you know, that those shouldn't be the issues that we're having. And those are the issues that are primarily in communities of color. So once again, I will say that I've been very, very blessed to 
currently go to a school where I'm not battling anti-blackness when I'm in this specific menstrual equity space, but once I leave my little biome of Hampton University, it's a completely different story. And I try to make my dent in that anti-blackness communication platform. Thank you. So we have a couple more questions from the audience, which is amazing. Thank you everyone who's submitting your questions and also thank you for watching. For anyone who wants to ask a question, there is a little Q&A note or icon at the bottom and you can click that and submit a question. So I will go to the next one, Tamika. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, Mika is asking, why do you think period products are so inaccessible to some communities? And Miriam, if you would like to take it away. Yeah, I think it really comes back to just the intersectionality of these issues. Um, a lot of these are directly because of systemic and historical policies we've had to disenfranchise um, people, to disenfranchise women, to disenfranchise women of color, and specifically black women. Um, and I think having that kind of honest conversation is is really um, how we start. And I think a lot of this work um, does revolve around direct action and grassroots organizing, but it's also talking about the policy oriented side of things and, and kind of uprooting things that have been written into our laws, into our governments, into our system. Um, I think it's something that we definitely need to have um, you know, a broader conversation about. And I think period products being inaccessible is just a, a symptom of a much bigger disease of just racism in our country, of, of classism, of so much more. And I think that's why the inaccessibility of, of period products represents so much more when it comes to just equity and a lot of the issues we're dealing with. And that's why at the same time, doing this work around period products is starting to kind of solve those issues and, and chip away at so many of those systems we see. Yeah, um, I, speaking of like just uh, period poverty being a symptom, I think that ultimately period poverty is a symptom of capitalism, right? So if we have an economic system that relies on their being poor people in order for there to be people at the top, we are always going to have people that will never be able to afford managing their period. At the end of the day, when we also compound that capitalism with the reality that, 30, that women in America are like 35% more likely to live in poverty, there's always going to be a gendered uh, lens on how people experience uh, oppression and how people experience exploitation. And once we kind of mesh uh, period products and period management into a capitalist system, at the end of the day, we are always going to have to fight for the people who have to choose between food and a tampon because they can't choose both. Um, it's either one or the other. So I think that period poverty is a symptom to capitalism and capitalism is definitely um, entrenched in racial inequality and all of these other gendered inequality and all of these other inequalities, but ultimately it is a byproduct of a larger economic faulty system. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I also completely agree with all of your statements because if you think about it, who is the predominant population of our government? It is 40 to 70 year old white men who don't get their period. Um, they don't exactly experience any repression oppression in their daily lives. They haven't felt that type of struggle that um, we, you know, we embody sometimes during our daily lives. And so they completely pass policies that only benefit themselves because that's the pro that's the situation of them being, you know, um, in the government, you know, that's the reason they got into government to um, help themselves. And we can tell literally just by our president that he simply passes policies that only benefit the rich, only benefit the affluent white people. Um, and that's not a surprise. It's just kind of been that system for a while. And um, that's why we're here. That's why we're here to simply end that because it's not something that we want to see happen forever. It's not something that as we uh, a very diverse country, you know, we all come from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different races, and yet we still experience the situation in our government. Um, 
and those who are in those communities don't get the right representation that they deserve. They don't get that same um, policy. They don't get their opinions heard um, because I guess we just have to be louder, you know? <laughs> um, there's no other way to fix that, I suppose. But um, yeah, uh, basically when we were at the period rally, I remember we literally yelled, like pointed to Congress because we were in DC, so we were in the hub of it all. Um, and we literally pointed to Congress and was like, you know, like, come on, you know, let's, let's fix this. Um, so that's definitely a situation in our system. That's why we really fight for representation in our government. That's why we, we praise people like, uh, like see Kamala, we see um, all these amazing like women who are taking, taking lead in their field and taking the opportunity to show that you can make a stand, you can make a stand and you can make a change. Um, so it's definitely something that our system has been going on forever, but hopefully not for longer. So one thing I wanted to add um, to the question regarding period products being so accessible and inaccessible, excuse me, in some communities, I think the primary reason is because people don't realize that menstrual health is a part of healthcare. And I think a lot of people like don't realize how important it is because not everyone is seeing a doctor regarding their period. So with regards to accessibility, you know, are menstrual products affordable? Are you able to find quality products in, in your community? Like there are prison systems where people are not allowed to have tampons, like a tampon. And so people are having to make, make like roll pads into tampons and put those in and that's not necessarily the most sanitary way or people have to keep tampons or pads on for longer than they have to because they have to, like in certain prison systems, um, I did a research project on the last semester and like they, like some, some prisons you have to buy them still, like they're not given out for free. So if they only have $2 and they're gonna spend 50, 150 on food because they're not being fed adequately enough. They only have 50 cents to spend on pads. Well, a menstrual cycle is five days and let's say you change your pad, hopefully like four to five times throughout the day. If they only got three pads in the pack, they're keeping a pad on for longer than they really should have to. So when it comes to inaccessibility, like we need to normalize the conversation around periods that it is a form of health care. Like granted, you are able to go to the grocery store and pick one up and take it home with you, but it is just as important as going to the doctor and getting a flu shot or getting a pap smear. Like why is it that there's so much attention put around condoms, which go right next to the menstrual products, but and those are easily accessible, but like having access to quality products in certain communities is like a no-go. I love that you brought that up because it is so very true. It's not seen in a lot of places because I think it is just something that like it's, there's really no policies that are in place for menstrual products. It's not really considered part of healthcare, which is crazy because it absolutely is and so many members of our population are menstruating individuals. Um, so we do have a few more questions here. Um, I will go with, what role do you believe youth activists play in fighting for menstrual equity and in building a more diverse movement for marginalized communities? Um, Amber, would you like to start us off on that one? Okay. Once again, I'm just rereading the question because it was a little, I want to make sure I hit everything. Oh yeah, sure. Um, I guess I can address this from my personal perspective. So organizing on my campus, as I said, I attend historically black college. So it looks a lot different when comparing it to a, a campus that is predominantly white or comparing it to a Catholic college, the organization like the organization, as an organizer, excuse me, wow. Um, the efforts that I have to put in are a little different simply because there's so, like everybody around me is black. So I have to put so much more emphasis on that. And when I'm trying to, um, 
I guess it's a little different for me because the majority of the people around me are black. So like everybody's kind of with it and I'm not having to fight so hard, but I guess the, the people that I'm fighting the hardest is my administration. Um, because I guess they just see it as, you know, if you can afford $40,000, you can afford to go buy a 10 pack, a $10 pack of tampons or pads. And trying to, it's, it's a little different for me trying to like, Hmm. to make it more well for me it's not I'm not really making it more diverse because this is a part of my everyday conversations that I'm having on my campus um but I think it's just because I'm at a historically black college so it's a little different um and I don't do a whole lot at outside of Hampton University like I don't go and like protest at um at random rallies simply because one, my schedule doesn't work like that, but two, I also just don't necessarily feel safe in the area that I'm around. Um, but definitely um, centering the conversations around marginalized communities and ensuring that you're thinking of everybody who has a seat at the table. So whether that's an LGBTQ plus person, um, a black individual, an international student, a student athlete, like you need to ensure that you're allowing everybody at the con everybody to have a seat at the conversation, uh, everybody to have a seat at the table so that we are all incorporating their ideas into the change we want to see. Yeah, I completely agree because intersectionality is something that we've obviously highlighted as much as we possibly can in the space because again, we, let's, I can't exactly fend for a person who's been in an impoverished community and not be able to afford it because I am able to afford it. You know, I'm able to go to the grocery store and simply buy a pad, but a lot of people don't have that luxury. So I'm not able to um, show my opinions of a person in that space because we don't, I'm not, I'm not feeling someone who has had that situation. Um, so that's why intersectionality, we really try to incorporate that as much as we can because all opinions matter, all opinions have a different side and all opinions will always matter um, because it's, um, and as we incorporate more youth activists, um, we are definitely evolving as a more diverse nation. Um, and the more that we incorporate youth activists, the more that we get angry and the more that we see that there are real injustices that we all need to fight together. Um, so it's really, it's really important. It's every single event that I've gone to, it's really empowering to see all these youth activists because it makes me want to do more. It makes me realize that maybe I can do this, you know, maybe I can be a part of um, something greater, even though it's maybe donating pad or donating a few pads because um, obviously it's very intimidating to go into the movement in the first place but when we incorporate more youth activists and seeing more opinions out there um, we definitely want to get into it it's it's like when we're little and we have like we have this idol um, like Michelle Obama when you see Michelle Obama doing all this work as um, an amazing first lady it makes you want to do stuff like that too um, as a black woman as well, it's also empowering to see someone of color up there and doing such amazing work. So um, that's why I feel like intersectionality is such a highlight importance, not only in this space, but obviously worldwide as well. Thank you. So we unfortunately are running out of time here, um, but thank you for all of the great questions. I wish we could answer all of them and I wish we could talk about this all day long, but um, I would love to wrap it up by asking each of you what your one call to action would be and to please link us to your social media so we can follow you on your journey through fighting period poverty and working on menstrual equity. And Brie, would you like to take the stage? Yeah, of course. Um, I guess I'll start with my call to action. I think for me, I would say, identify the most marginalized person in your community, ask them their story, ask them what they need, ask them what they envision as a solution 
and help them get there. Um, I think that that is the most simplified uh, way that allows us to center the right people. Um, and my, you can find my work on bereadic.com or um, all of my social media handles are at bereadic. And yeah, I was really, I really enjoyed uh, this panel today. So thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you amazing panelists. I can share my one call to action. So um, like Bree said, having a conversation is very, very important. So we obviously have to start somewhere. And I think a lot of people don't realize that these types of conversations are sometimes more impactful on the micro level. So having these conversations with your sister, your mom, your grandma, the man sitting across from you in the park, like you don't know who you're, you don't know who this person might share your ideas with. So this one little ripple that you're making in the movement could be making waves next week, next month, next year. So starting to have these conversations now and normalizing the conversation around menstrual equity, um, we are ensuring that we are protecting the future, but also getting justice for us right now. Um, yeah, it's, I think uh, there's a huge um, misconception that we need to create a rally for it or we need to start a protest or have a, a centralized event so that we can just talk about periods. But really like a period should be a part of our everyday conversation. I should be able to go to you and say, hi, I'm on my menstrual cycle right now. Can I please have a pad? Like that, that it should be a part of that daily banner. So just starting those conversations on the micro level so that they can have further huge impacts on the macro level. Um, and my social media, it's in, it's uh, at xmber.x on Instagram. Yeah, um, I think my call to action would definitely be um, to look in your community, find people who are doing this work of menstrual justice and offer to volunteer your time, maybe just ask them a question about how they're doing the work, um, reach out and explore. And if you see that you don't really have anything like that in your community, go ahead, look to other community groups. Um, you can literally look at other people from across the country and even the world, look at what other people are doing. Um, and kind of get involved to figure out what you can get involved in, whether it might be, you know, like making social media posts or helping coordinate, um, you know, taking those, those small steps um, is a really great way to get involved. Um, my social media is in the chat. Uh, it, was, it was great talking to all of you. Um, I think this work is so tiring in the midst of a pandemic, but it's so, so rewarding. I think everyone here can agree with that. Um, I remember we were kind of doing the work for the rally and I remember when I was growing up as a kid, pads were not talked about in my house. We did not have that conversation. Everything would be stored and hidden under a cabinet. We wouldn't be talking about it. And now a few years later, um, we were getting ready for our first rally and my four-year-old sister's just openly playing with pads and everyone's like, oh, whatever, pads, it doesn't matter. And she knows what they are. Um, and that kind of education and that kind of growth that I've seen, I would never have been in that situation, even as a teen growing up. Um, but to see what we leave behind for future generations of menstruators is so, so inspiring and uplifting. Um, here's to continuing that fight for menstrual justice. Yeah, I would definitely um, engage in all of your call to actions. Um, and also, um, my call to action is simply read up about the movement. Um, I know uh, earlier in the chat was Alicia's um, Teen Vogue article about period poverty and the space, especially during the pandemic, um, which is a great example of how to stay informed about the movement. And um, I would definitely engage in conversation again with those who don't exactly know about periods like my brother whenever I'm on my period I'll be like I'm on my period I'll be like oh my gosh like <laughs> um so I think it's really cool to see um and have conversations with those who don't exactly talk about it because they should you know it's a normal bodily function um and then reading up about it is something that'll make you stay informed and make you realize that this this problem is apparent this problem is in this world and it's something that needs to be corrected um and yes thank you so much all for coming and it was great listening to all the panelists 
Um, my, the, you can follow my social media at Mission Red, um, which is organization um, in the chat. And thank you again so much for coming and thanks to all the panelists. Thank you again, everyone. It was so wonderful speaking with you. And again, happy period action day. This has been a really great discussion and I'm so honored to have met you all and learned so much about you and your work as I'm sure the audience can agree. And I believe Amir is about to take over and close us out. Yeah, well, thank you so much uh, to Alicia for, for leading this and to all the panelists, uh, Brie, Hannah, Mariam, Mariam and Amber, you guys are uh, amazing. It's always great uh, listening to you guys speak. So thank you for all your work and everything you guys do. Um, and then for everyone else on, thank you guys for being here. Um, in about two hours from now at 2 p.m. Um, PST, we're going to have Madam Gandhi. She's going to uh, keynote. So we would love to see you guys on. If you just hop onto the Period Action Day website, you'll find the link there that you can join. So uh, check that out. And then we're also, if, if you go on there, you'll this recording will be on the website uh, once it's done and, and uh, put down. So we'll have that up there for everyone to see later on as well. So, yeah. But other than that, thank you all for being here. And I <laughs> can't wait to see you on the next call. Thank you. <laughs>